Hello and welcome to this socially distanced interview in a well-ventilated backyard. My name is Jordan Cole and I am a member of a committee commissioned by the City Club of Portland. We considered alternative voting methods that would deliver more equitable representation for Portland residents. Our report, New Government for Today's Portland, Rethinking How We Vote and How Portland Works, was completed in February 2020. But recent events have delayed our launch. I'm very excited because I'm joined here today by three of my colleagues from the committee. Mark Stefan, our committee's chair, Carissa Page, our committee's deputy chair, and Paulina LaPerry, our head writer. Mark, as chair, I'd like to start with you. Tell us about some of the reasons for the report. Thanks, Jordan. Um, as you know, uh, our current city council is one of the most diverse it has been um, in history. And yet, when you really look at the history of the Portland City Council, we know that it has not had uh, the sort of diversity that it could. Uh, the Sightline Institute has actually pointed out some really important information about this that kind of gives us a sense of, of how bad it's been. Uh, if you look over the last 30 years, for example, uh, and you look at the number of years that commissioners uh, have been on uh, the city council or the number of years altogether that have been served, uh, over two-thirds of those years have been served by council members who come from the most affluent neighborhoods, or at least some of the most affluent neighborhoods in all of Portland. Um, we've only had one council member who's been from North Portland, and only two who have come from east of 82nd Avenue. The fact is, is that in terms of people of color as well on the council, we have, have just not lived up to expectations. Part of the reason for this clearly has to be the at-large election system that we have. Um, a system where city council members are elected citywide, not in particular districts. Uh, for a variety of reasons, um, this is problematic. Um, if you think about it this way, uh, a majority in the city of Portland, a majority of voters, can at any time pick all of the city council members. People can consistent, consistently be left out of the city council um, representation in the sense of voting representation. 49% of the voters can consistently be left out of proper representation for their interest. Uh, and this is a point of concern. This sort of distorted representation has been a problem in other cities in the past. Um, and partly for this reason, almost every major city in this country has gotten rid of at-large representation. Since 1965, whether voluntarily or through lawsuits, most cities have chosen to move in a different direction. In fact, there are only two cities, Portland and Columbus, two, two large cities in the country who still use this form of representation. Thanks, Mark. Some people may ask, but why should I care? Or how has this affected the outcomes here in Portland? Carissa, what would you say to that? Mark was talking to some of this earlier. If you come from certain communities or certain neighborhoods in Portland, you're far less likely to have a voice in City Hall. And regardless of where you live, you have no representative to call your own. Well, let me give you an example to illustrate how this type of system impacts the kind of outcomes we see. Fairly or not, many people in Portland consider 82nd Avenue to be a better neighborhood. Never mind that East of 82nd is home to 30% of Portland's population and 40% of its youth. It's also the most diverse and rapidly growing part of Portland. But this is a part of Portland that also has seen a clear and long-standing backlog of neglect. From inadequate sidewalks to streets, lights, sewer systems. As Mark was explaining earlier, uh, Part of the issue is that Portland upholds a system in which no one is answerable to this geographic area. Other than Joanne Hardesty, the only other commissioner to have hailed from east of 82nd is Randy Leonard, who left council in 2012. This is also part of Portland that is less likely to vote and far less likely to donate to political campaigns. You know, I think more work needs to be done to understand why 
east of 82nd has lower voter turnout. But generally speaking, I think that when people feel disenfranchised, when they feel like their vote doesn't matter, they're naturally going to be less enthused about participating in the system. Thanks, Carissa. Portland's current system of at-large voting has been around for 107 years, since 1913. Polina, why now? What prompted City Club to commission this report? As some of you may remember, early in 2019, the Portland City Club released a landmark report that sparked a wide conversation about what kind of system of government we want to have here in Portland. Specifically, the report was focused on Portland's antiquated and quirky commission form of government. In this system, commissioners serve as both legislators and executives. In city bureaus that aren't assigned to them until after they're elected, might not have anything to do with their previous expertise and can change at any time. Last year's committee came to a clear and compelling conclusion that this system of government is deeply inequitable and extremely inefficient. It's important to note that the system of at-large voting is closely tied to the commission form of government. Otherwise, if the city were to divide into districts, you could end up in a situation where a representative from one district was responsible for all the city's parks or all of its utilities, which could lead to really corrupt results. Because last year's report strongly recommended changing the commission form of government, the City Club realized that it was also important to study the separate but closely related issue of voting, and that's what led to them commissioning this committee. Thanks, Paulina. I'd like to hear more about the committee's research process. Carissa, what approach did the committee use to guide its analysis and conclusions? So first and foremost, we adopted an equity lens to guide our work. We also agreed to seven uh, principles, all rooted in equity considerations to inform our analysis. We tried to talk to as many people as we could in the time frame we had. We wanted to hear from a diverse range of voices to, to learn different aspects of the issue and hear competing view, viewpoints and triangulate findings to draw our own conclusions. We talked to uh, voting experts at think tanks and universities in Portland and across the country. We talked to somebody who ran the Districts Now campaign in 2013 in Seattle, as well as some change experts, change, some people who ran change campaigns in, in California. Uh, we also talked to a couple commissioners who each offered a unique point of view. Uh, in addition, we talked to a panel of community leaders hailing from various community-based organizations in Portland. And speaking for me personally, that's the one that impacted me the most. Thanks, Carissa. Mark. What were the main conclusions that emerged from the report? What are some of the key headlines that we want people to take away? So there were three key headlines uh, for the committee. Um, the first one I've basically already talked about. We, we absolutely need to move towards district representation. Uh, Portland likes to think of itself as weird, but this is not a characteristic of our politics that we should be proud of. Uh, so we need to move away from at-large um, voting. We also support, as a committee, and strongly so, a multi-member district form of government. Um, a lot of people out there aren't necessarily familiar with multi-member districts, uh, but the basic idea is that multi-member districts allow greater representation of, of minority interest in a given district. They allow wider representation in that district. Um, implementing this um, requires, on some level, some sort of proportional representation to make it really work effectively. Uh, so this would uh, involve some other changes as well. Um, this sounds complicated, uh, but really it isn't that complicated. A number of cities uh, have been doing this already with success. Uh, and it is something that we can replicate. The third point uh, to reinforce that we strongly, strongly felt about uh, was that we need to move to an old... The third point that we felt strongly about was that we need to move to an electoral system where all of the voting happens when most people vote in November. The system we have now, the two-step process of primaries and the general election, 
actually mean that a huge number of voters are not involved in a lot of decision making because they're not voting in the primaries in May. If we move to something like uh, ranked choice voting in particular, um, we could deal with this problem and have all of the voting occurring in November when the bulk of voters are participating. Thanks, Mark. There's another important conclusion that our committee came to. Paulina, could you speak to that? We really want to make sure we recognize the importance of hearing from communities who have been historically marginalized by the current system of government about the reasons why they choose to vote or not, to understand their perspectives about representation, and to hear from them about what kinds of solutions would best address their concerns. Carissa mentioned the panel of leaders from community-based organizations that we met with in January. That panel was humbling. It really underscored our biases and limitations and also underscored how important it is to make sure that we bring to the table diverse community leaders who are already doing so much amazing work to advocate for change here in Portland. Our committee's report is one part of a much larger conversation and in particular, we know that the city of Portland is currently assembling a charter review commission to take a hard look at these issues and many others. We hope and expect that the commission will be intentional about elevating the voices of historically marginalized communities as part of this process, because that ultimately is the point. We need diverse voices at the table to make sure that city government is really, really working for all the communities that it's meant to work for. Thanks, Paulina. I have one last question. There's been a lot of changes in the last eight months. Paulina, what happened that affects the report and its recommendations? In the past nine months to year, Great Choice Voting, or RCV, has really gained a lot of momentum in places around the U.S. I'll just illustrate a few examples. In New York City late last year, voters decided to move toward Great Choice Voting beginning in 2021. This is a really big deal because New York City is by far the largest place in the U.S. to put RCV to the test. By the time all of you are watching this, Maine will have become the first state to use RCV in a presidential election, although four states did already use it in their primaries. Voters in Massachusetts and Alaska also decided whether to implement RCV for some of their statewide races. And right here in Oregon, Benton County just became the first to use RCV for their county commissioner race. And I understand there are some representatives working to bring a statewide initiative to use RCV in Oregon. Thanks, Paulina. It's hard to believe how much has transpired in 2020. Carissa, I imagine that you might have something to say about what has changed as well. Yeah, a lot has happened in the last eight months and not just a global pandemic. Um, as you all know, uh, Portland has been the epicenter of racial justice protests in the United States. Uh, in addition, uh, voting rights have very much been in the national spout spotlight as we head into an election with historic levels of voter suppression. And when Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG, passed away a little over a month ago, I couldn't help but recall some of her words in her scathing, that she wrote in her scathing dissent in 2013 when the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, in that dissent, uh, she said that the work wasn't finished, that there were major issues uh, that remained. And she named two, quote, second generation issues. One, gerrymandering, and two, at-large voting. I have to say that as, uh, you know, we have the largest call for racial justice since the 1960s. I think it's sad that Portland is one of two large cities in this country that continues to maintain this form of voting. We like to think of ourselves as progressive, but if we're serious about racial justice, I think changing the way we vote is one of the first things we need to do. The uh, recent events have only made clear that the need for action is, is urgent. It, it needs to happen now. 